Hello there, and thank you for tuning in to see what the world looks like through atheist eyes. I'm Frank Zindler from American Atheist Press, and I'll be your host for this second of four programs in which I interview Professor David Brackey of The Ohio State University. Dr. Brackey is a world-famous authority on Gnosticism. Today we'll learn more about Gnosticism and about other research interests of a world-class scholar. Let's get right to the interview with Professor Brackey. Hello there, and welcome once again to Through Atheist Eyes with Frank Zindler. Last time, I had as my guest Professor David Brackey from The Ohio State University, and we were talking about Gnosticism, a subject on which he is a world authority. And at that time, I pointed out his curriculum vitae, which is 23 pages long, 12-point type, and uh, single-spaced, <laughs> listing all of his achievements and accomplishments and productions, writing and otherwise. And in the last program, we only had time, and barely that, uh, to talk about Gnosticism and, and his work on Gnosticism and define that. And uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about any of these other things here, uh, what it's like to be teaching at The Ohio State University and all of his other research interests and things that I think atheists will be interested in, uh, if not just to say, oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank God I'm an atheist. No. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, I think that, David, before we get into these other things, mm -hmm. it would be a good idea to just reprise briefly what is Gnosticism or what we use, what, what we mean when we use that term, and then we'll go into these other things. But let, let's review what is Gnosticism. Um, Gnosticism is a term that uh, historians of religion use to refer to a group of movements, texts, people from about the first century of our era into maybe the fifth, sixth century of our era. Um, a group of movements that emphasized gnosis, knowledge of God, and usually believed that the God who made this world is not the ultimate mm -hmm. true God. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And that we can have esoteric knowledge by studying in some way. Or and, whatever. and perhaps even in this life have some sort of contact with that ultimate ah, God. Ah, right, okay. Right, in a mystical experience of some kind. Okay. In fact, I, I think I'm having contact right now. He's telling <laughs> me, send your money to... <laughs> Well, the Gnostic ultimate god would never tell oh, you such think a so. thing. No. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> no, no. well, maybe it is indeed a better god. <laughs> um, David, you are the uh, Joe R. Engel Chair in the History of Christianity mm -hmm. and a professor of history at The Ohio State University. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you come to be at The Ohio State University and, and what are you doing there? Um, well, for most of my career, after I got my PhD until 2012, I was a professor in the Religious Studies Department at Indiana University in Bloomington, um, which was which remains one of the great uh, departments of religious studies. At a and that's state one university. of my alma maters, by right. the way. Right. Uh, I got my master's in geology from that same campus. <laughs> right. So it's a it's a great place, and I loved my yeah, time there. Yeah, I loved there. it too. Um, and uh, Ohio State, um, unlike Indiana, does not have a department of religious studies. Instead, the people who study uh, religion and all its manifestations <clears throat> are dispersed among different uh -huh. yeah. uh, departments. And uh, Joe Engel, who was a, um, a man of great accomplishment, who came from Coshocton, Ohio, wow. and ended up making a lot of money and was uh, very active in the Presbyterian Church, uh, he gave money to The Ohio State University to form this chair in the History of Christianity in the History Department. Um, and um, Ohio State, when he passed away, um, the chair was established, and Ohio State invited me to come and take on this position. And, uh, and I was excited to do so. It was kind of a nice mid-career new challenge well, yeah, um, it's, to, it's to yeah. move and talk about Christianity and the study of religion within a history department, not a department of religious studies. And uh, it's been a really great experience uh, doing that. And part of my challenge has been to kind of 
um, get going within the history department uh, more of a sense that undergraduates, graduate students can focus on Christianity as, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. part of mm -hmm. uh, global history. Now, uh, in your teaching, uh, and of course as part of your uh, study of Gnosticism, uh, you had to learn the ancient Coptic language and Syriac and, and, and so on, and um, You've been you have taught those languages, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I did more of that at Indiana, at Indiana. Um, right? Um, I've only now been at Ohio State for three years, so I haven't had opportunity to teach Coptic yet to anyone mm -hmm. who's interested. But uh, and at Ohio State, we're lucky to have someone who's a much better scholar of Syriac <laughs> than I am. So so he's been teaching that, I see. Uh, okay. including to the students who work with me, right? I see. Uh, graduate students. Um, so I have not been teaching those languages recently, but that I have in the past, yes. Now, I suppose some of our viewers may be wondering, well, why would anybody other than that nut Frank Zindler be <laughs> studying Syriac? Uh, <laughs> can you justify that right. <laughs> to um, my audience? <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, Syriac um, is one of the um, many dialects of Aramaic, mm -hmm. which um, in Christian history, of course, is famous because it would yeah. have been what Jesus yeah. and, the, um, and his disciples would have spoken. Um, but uh, Syriac um, became the language of a huge tradition in Christianity. I mean, um, I think most people don't realize this, but probably around the year 800, there were more Christians who looked to their supreme leader as the, um, uh, the Bishop of Baghdad uh -huh. than to either the Bishop of Rome or the Bishop of Constantinople. In other words, there was this huge church that we yeah. now call the Church of the East, Yes. whose basic language was Syriac and uh, had congregations from Syria sure. um, all the way to China. Yeah. Right, the first Christians to get to China <coughs> were the these... Silk Road and all yes, of that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And they made it to mm -hmm. China and, um, and so on. So there's a huge body of interesting um, Christian literature in Syriac. And of course, there are Syrian Orthodox Christians uh, to this day. Um, Syriac is also useful for study of the Bible also because, of course, there were very early translations of the Bible into Syriac, and so sometimes it gives us access to readings and so forth of the biblical texts that the Greek and Latin don't preserve. But, but above all, Syriac, and oddly enough, there's also, you know, I work mostly in, in Egyptian Christianity, sure. <clears throat> and there's also texts from Egyptian Christianity that survive only in Syriac. In Syria, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, I should mention that uh, in the early translations of the Bible of the New Testament, anyway, into Syriac, uh, there's a very famous uh, manuscript from Sinai. Uh, the Codex Sinaiticus Syriacus, I guess, yeah. <laughs> uh, which has the genealogy of Jesus, uh, and there is no virgin birth. Is this and Jacob begat Joseph, and Joseph begat Jesus, and uh, it obviously reflects an earlier uh, Greek forlaga of uh, the text. Uh, where, well, you may disagree. I don't yeah, know. I'm not sure. I uh, doubt it's earlier, but it does show that there were, you know, all these different readings going yeah, around yeah, at some point, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the whole history of the virgin birth doctrine, uh, I think, is greatly informed by that manuscript. I'm sure, yeah, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. anyway. Okay, so uh, you haven't been teaching the languages particularly at the Ohio State. Uh, and what other courses now are you teaching? Um, well, I teach um, for undergraduates. My basic course is a history of Christianity from, as I put it, from Jesus to Joel yeah. Osteen. <laughs> um, that covers the whole history in a semester, so it's obviously oh, selective. Yeah. But, yeah. but I hope to communicate to students um, how the tradition has developed and diversified and yeah. so forth. It so. hasn't been a monolith from the beginning. Uh, That's right, uh, yes. Uh, if my course is successful at the end of it, students are perplexed about what it means to be a Christian. <laughs> what Christianity, how you could define it yeah, even, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then for more upper level courses for um, students in, um, I teach a course in the history of just early Christianity from Jesus mm -hmm. to about 500 mm -hmm. or so. Um, I teach a course in Gnosticism, in Gnostic uh, religion. Um, I have a course on women and gender in the early church. Uh, last semester I taught, taught a course on the Reformation, the 16th century Reformation in Europe, yeah, so I got a yeah. little outside my normal comfort yeah, zone, yeah, wow. but it was, it was great to do. Um, I also teach, um, uh, pretty much all of us in the history department try to teach a course that introduces students to the study of history. Oh, okay. And that is how you 
reason with evidence, the difference between primary and secondary sources, and so forth. And I'm teaching mm -hmm. that course actually mm -hmm. this semester. Mm -hmm. And uh, and for graduate students, I teach courses that are both Christianity oriented. I taught a seminar on saints' lives. What oh. can the historian do with a saint's life? You know, and. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, and uh, right now I'm teaching a course on sex and gender in the ancient world. They had it in the ancient world? They did. <laughs> they had sex and gender, both those things, yes. Lots of sex and so, gender. So I teach courses that are uh, Christianity-focused, mm -hmm. uh, that are kind of antiquity-focused, um, and also that just kind of introduce students to theory and method in the study of history. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Uh, now, <clears throat> we've already looked at some of your... Uh, interest in Gnosticism, and we'll devote a whole program to your book, uh, The Gnostics. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about some of your other research interests. Uh, you are an authority on the monastic movements uh, and the characters therein. Can you tell us right. about that? Right. That was actually the first, um, my first two books really were actually about early monasticism, hmm. which, um, you know, really got going in Egypt in the 4th and 5th centuries, right? Um, and here, too, the language Coptic, the last stage of the sure. Egyptian language, yeah. is, is an important resource for understanding how this got going. Now, these are not, monasticism and Gnosticism are not totally unrelated. No, no, no. Uh, no. In the sense that um, the Nag Hammadi codices that we've talked about several times mm -hmm. um, were copied and buried in Egypt sometime probably in the late 4th or first half of the 5th centuries at the same time as yeah. monasticism was getting going. Yeah, yeah. And one popular theory is that it was monks who copied yes. these texts uh -huh. and found them interesting and then preserved them. Uh, there's a, we can't really prove that. And yeah, yeah, know yeah. it for sure, um, but that's one possibility. So, um, so one of the things I've, I've just been interested in is the monastic life and how um, monks used spiritual discipline and so on to shape themselves as virtuous persons. Now, one of the things that fascinated me as I read through your uh, Vita <laughs> is uh, the recurrence of demons and yes, wars yes, with demons. Uh, right. What in the world is that all about? Well, um, uh, that was one of my books is on uh, the role of demons in the monastic life. If you read early monastic literature, and indeed even monastic literature from the medieval period, um, demons show up a lot. Um, the first famous monk is St. Antony, mm -hmm. and his life was written in the 350s, and it depicts him as moving into an abandoned tomb and secluding himself where he did physical battle with demons. Who <laughs> He claimed it anyway. Yes, <laughs> uh, or, the, or at least the life claims. Uh, whether Antony himself claimed oh, it, okay, but the okay, life okay, says he yeah. battled with demons who took the shape of you know snakes and lions and so forth and so on. Um, and other monastic literature talks about demons appearing to people, appearing to monks as, say, beautiful women to mm -hmm. entice them to have sex or whatever. And, um, and monks universally believed in the ancient period that often if you have a tempting thought, mm -hmm. you know, maybe I should go into the city and look at the beautiful women I yeah. can see, that that's a demon suggesting that to you. And so... Um, so I found this fascinating, and it is something that when modern people think about monks, we usually think about them just praying and, yeah, good and helping yeah. people. But in ancient time, one of the big things monks did is do battle with demons, both in their thoughts. Well, you know, so I mean, we even have as late as Martin Luther, I guess maybe not demons, I, it was the, the devil himself he threw the right. well at or something. Yes, yeah, yeah, and obviously uh, the, the belief in the existence of demons continues yeah. to the present. Yes, yes. You're right, it's not as prominent a feature of, interestingly, I think, of monastic life as it once was, um, but certainly in my period, um, what did it mean to struggle to be a good person? It meant struggling against the demons who wish to tempt us to do yeah. evil and yeah. to not trust in God yeah. and so forth and so on. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, even the, the new pope, the, the guy that named himself after me, uh, is, <laughs> is apparently doing exorcisms. Have you heard that? Uh, exorcism has kind of come back, so yeah. to speak. Um, uh, you know, one can argue that in the history of Christianity, there have been really kind of three major periods of heavy demonic activity and exorcism. <laughs> um, the early period, yeah, the you know, yeah. the first yeah. 500 years yeah. or so, right? Um, um, the early modern era, mm -hmm. uh, the 
period of the Reformation that you yeah, mentioned with yeah, Luther. Yeah, I mean, exorcism, yeah. talking about witches and demons became a very big thing in that period. And then one might argue today. I mean, yeah. it doesn't take much surfing on YouTube to find plenty of sure. videos of exorcisms being performed and, yeah. and the like. And yeah. so, um, so it seems as though, yeah, demons are, are back, yeah. so to speak. Now, one of the things that uh, I found interesting about your scholarly career is you're doing an edition, uh, an, an authoritative edition of the writings of uh, Shenouda the Great, mm -hmm. Saint Shenouda or Shenouda. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this, I'm sure, will be very, very recherche to our <laughs> viewers, as sophisticated as most of them are. But nevertheless, um, could you tell us about that and why is Shenouda or Shenouda uh, significant or interesting, at least. Uh -huh. uh, what's this all about? Shenouda was a, um, a leader of Egyptian monasticism in the 4th and 5th centuries. He died in 465, uh, and he led a large monastic community consisting of two monasteries for men and one for women. Um, and so he was a pioneer in organizing the monastic life, so his works give us a glimpse into mm -hmm. really the daily life and the rules and the problems and conflicts within a very early monastic community. Mm -hmm. um, he also took a very big leadership role in his in the religious life of his region and was a vigorous opponent of paganism uh, to the point that he actually broke into the houses of prominent wealthy people looking for pagan idols that yeah, he would wow. then expose and so <laughs> forth and so on. So he was... Uh, uh, and he was also a vigorous critic of wealthy people and their oppression of the poor. He was kind of a mm -hmm. populist mm -hmm. kind of religious mm -hmm. leader. Um, and he was also an amazing orator and author. And he is by far the most important uh, native writer of the Coptic language, this last stage of Egyptian. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if our greatest writer was Shakespeare, for the Copts yeah. it was yeah. Shenouda. Um, and he remains a hero to the Coptic church. Um, the Pope before the present Pope of yes. the Coptic Church was named yes. Shenouda. And uh, the church, Shenouda, one of the, his big projects was building a large church for his monastery, uh, which was probably completed in the 440s, and um, it still stands today. Wow, Without its gosh. roof, its roof was probably oh wood and it's yeah, gone, yeah, but yeah. otherwise the walls remain and so forth. So he's an extremely um, important figure um, and... Uh, just a fascinating person to read. His works give us a lot of insight, not only into early monastic life, but into the religious and social life of his environment. Mm -hmm. What were economic relations like? What were how did pagans and Christians get along and not get along, and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. um, so, but because he, he did write in Coptic, sure. And um, what happens is, of course, is eventually Coptic Christians, starting in the seventh century when the Muslims invade Egypt is eventually Coptic Christians stop speaking Coptic right. and, to stop, Arabic. and they yeah. go to Arabic. Mm -hmm. And so Shenouda's works were lost. They were no longer copied and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so they lack a kind of complete, comprehensive critical edition and translation. And that's what I and another and a group of scholars, there are about a dozen of us oh, really? that from many? North America and Europe that are working uh -huh. on producing. Yeah. Right. Now, these manuscripts are scattered all over, I understand. What happened was is that um, at some point, the ancient, the medieval, actually, codices that contained Shenouda's works um, were dismembered, kind of torn apart for various reasons, and many pages were lost, and what remained was scattered in various libraries. Um, and so it took... Um, a very amazing Coptologist, as we call them, <laughs> uh, named Stephen Emmel, who works in Münster in Germany, he figured out how to piece together all these dismembered books. Um, and so for my part of the project, there are, um, there are about five manuscripts that survive of the works of Shenouda that I'm working on, but they don't survive in one place. Instead, yeah, there are a yeah. few pages in Naples and a few pages in Paris and a bunch in Vienna and a bunch in London. So you have to go all over. Yeah. And, yeah. and read these and, and record their readings and sure. so forth and so on sure. and put them back together. So that's why it hasn't been done. You know, they, they, these things have been torn and scattered and much of it lost. Now, I, I'm trying to remember what other areas you've studied. You've done uh, critical editions of other ancient authors, haven't you? Uh, right. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, one of the um, 
another book I published is um, a translation of a book by an important Egyptian monk who died in 399 named Evagrius. Um, and he, he was very controversial, but he was one of the great um, theorists of the monastic life. What are mon monks doing and so forth and so on. But this is along the demon theme. Yeah, yeah. One of his um, most popular books in <laughs> ancient uh, and medieval Christianity was a book in Greek called Antireticus, which means talking back. <laughs> and what this book is, is a list of about 500 things demons might say to you <laughs> with the Bible verse that you should say to refute to the demon. <laughs> so it will give you, you know, the uh. demon will say something like, um, you know, well, it's Easter, so you should break your fast and eat a bunch of candy. <laughs> and then... Evagrius gives you the Bible verse you should say to refute oh my. this demon. This is modeled after, you know, in both Matthew and Luke, the devil comes to tempt Jesus. Oh, yes. And yes. Jesus refutes the devil by quoting from the scriptures. Oh, you know? right, right. And I have, yeah. But you, you know, the devil but says, say, turn yeah. these stones into bread. Yeah. And Jesus says, but it is written, yeah, yeah. man shall not live by bread alone. Yeah, so he's quoting yeah. scripture to refute the devil. I see. And Evagrius says, this is. Um, what we monks should do. And so uh, that book had never been translated completely into English. That must have been so fun. It was fun. And it, it uh, this is a, a great example of, uh, Evagrius was a Greek-speaking monk he wrote in Greek, but the text only survives in Syriac. Oh, my. In multiple manuscripts. There is also an Armenian version, which oh I did not look at. Oh, I, boy. I spent like a few months studying Armenian back when I was in graduate school, but I've not kept up with it. Well, that's probably what caused the uh, astigmatism in your glasses. Right, exactly. That's exactly right. <laughs> I had a headache with and, Armenian. Uh, and oddly, some of it actually survives in Sogdian. Oh, my things, goodness. Which, of course, I know nothing about. That's a um, Persian dialect, right? Is, right, yeah, which was, yeah. uh, which was um, spoken in uh, kind of the areas that we would call... Um, Afghanistan yeah, and so forth and yeah, so on. So yeah. it was an important yeah, language yeah. on the Silk Road. Yes, so yes, things were often exactly. transmitted in yeah. this language. But in any event, um, so you know, it's it. I did mo I did the Syriac. Yeah, that was, yeah, that's what yeah. I translated of this work of Evagrius. But um, but yes, and this is uh, what's great about Evagrius, among other things, is that he is the first person to say that actually you can organize the demons into a set. There is the demon of fornication the demon of gluttony oh boy. and sadness and anger. In other words, yeah, he gives yeah. us the first version of the seven deadly sins, exactly. <laughs> which are for him the principal demons. I see. And, um, and he has eight of them, actually. And he organizes this book, Talking Back, mm -hmm. um, by these demons. And he gives all the thoughts or yeah. things that the demon of fornication will right. say to you, the demon of anger will say to you. And yeah, so forth, yeah. dealing with agar avarice, love of money, and so on. So it's it's fun. It's a handbook for combating demons, so to speak. Now, uh, I'm wondering where do you where do you see your research going in the future? Uh, it, will it be more of the same things, or are there other areas that you're dying to get into? Or... <laughs> right. Um, well, I have a couple of projects going on, which um, is, of course, bad. You should focus on one, so I have too much going on. Um, some of it is in Gnosticism. Uh -huh. um, one of the um, best kind of introductions to Gnosticism, to, to its texts and ideas, is a book called The Gnostic Scriptures by Bentley oh, Layton, yes, who yes, was my yes. teacher. Mm -hmm. And my immediate project is to um, revise and update that book, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it was first published in 1987, and so it hasn't been, right. you know, so its introductions and its bibliographies need to be updated. But also we've had an important discovery since 1987, which is the Gospel of Judas. Of Judas, yes. So I need, and so we'll I'm talk gonna, about that so in gonna, the last Yes, yeah, so I'm going to translate that and put that in. So one thing is to update uh -huh. that book. And I've also been commissioned to write a new translation and commentary in the Gospel of Judas. That's a very long-range plan. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and then um, uh, something else I'm working on is um, I've written several articles about how the New Testament was formed, mm -hmm. the canon of okay. the New Testament. Yeah. And, um, and I have certain, uh, my own kind of view of how that happened and why it's important, and, uh, and I'd also would like to write a book on that. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. continuing to work on Gnosticism, continuing to work on monasticism with Shenouda, that is an ongoing mm -hmm. project, mm -hmm. and also some work in how the New Testament came to be. 
How do you like teaching at OSU? <laughs> uh, it's great. I mean, um, uh, that's Ohio State University. At Ohio State University, yeah. right. I mean, it's like Indiana. They're both, mm -hmm. you know, large yeah. state universities. Yeah. And uh, the great thing about um, the large state public university is that it is, the, I mean, what it's committed to is educating a lot, you know, a wide range of students. Mm -hmm. And so um, it really is a place where students from all sorts of backgrounds can come and get a really quality mm -hmm. education. And so mm -hmm. that's what one of the things I really love about it is that you have students who um, are from all backgrounds and you yeah. kind of, you know, it's not just the ones who can afford an elite education or so on. So Are, so are you like directing college. any doctoral students at this point? Um, I advise one. Uh, I have a doctoral student at, um, I haven't been at Ohio State long enough for them to yeah. dissertate. I see. Yeah, but yeah, yes, yeah. I, I have one who's at Ohio State who's my advisee and I work with others, but I had students at Indiana oh, that yeah. I'm still finishing up with, oh, actually. Oh, I see. So, I some, see. so Every now and then, I drive back to Bloomington to oh. see those students and mm -hmm. you know get them through and so forth. That's wonderful. I, so, I've never heard of any doctoral advisor who would do anything like that. Well, you can't just you know if you leave, you can't leave them. You know, orphaned. they do it all the time, <laughs> David. <laughs> well, not and not I would not do that. So um, so um, I love teaching at Ohio State, and one of the uh, interesting things about it is as opposed to Indiana, of course, now I'm teaching in a history department yes, rather yes. than a religious right. studies yeah. department. Yeah. And so I see in my classes um, a lot more students who have good historical background and fewer that have been doing a lot of studying of religion because uh, we don't have a lot of religious studies majors at Ohio State, unlike at Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm seeing a kind of, the, the students I teach now as undergraduates have a kind of different set of skills that they sure. come with. Sure. Um, and so that's been exciting for me as well. Well, just one last thing for this particular program. Uh -huh. uh, I want to tell my audience about how we came to meet. Yes. I've alluded to the fact that we were at a uh, meeting of the Society of Biblical Literature in San Diego, but uh, the fact was that uh, I gave David a copy of one of my books and my business card, and he looked at it, and he said, oh my goodness, we're neighbors. <laughs> and I said, I beg your pardon? And he said, well, yeah, I live about a block away from you, and indeed, it's less than a full block. It's a half uh, a diagonal of a city block away, and so I had to go all the way to the other side of the continent <laughs> to meet almost my next door neighbor. And what is so funny about this, uh, in addition, is for years I thought I was the only kid in the block who had any shelves of books in Coptic, and here is a man who has an enormous <laughs> library and has actually written some of the books that are on my shelves. And um, I thought, well, this is really fantastic. And then um, I found out just uh, on the way here uh, to tape this show that uh, he has spent not just one lecture at the Westfalische uh, Wilhelms Universität in Münster, Germany, but that he actually has spent quite a bit of time there. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting about this was that a number of years ago, I too had been invited to give a lecture at the uh, university there in Germany uh, to the same department. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so here we are just a block away from each other and uh, share so many interesting things. Oh, I, I forgot also, your doctorate is from Yale, and that's where I studied Arabic, and you're, um, you were chairman of the De Department of Religious Studies at Indiana University in Bloomington, and that's where I got my master's in geology. So, uh, I don't know, we don't look much like brothers, but maybe... <laughs> Maybe. There may not be a God, Frank, but there's oh. something that's bringing us together. Who knows what that is? All right. We don't know. We'll leave it at that. Uh, in our next show, we're going to really get into the meat of things. We're going to be diving into his book, The Gnostics, Myth, Ritual, and Diversity in Early Christianity. So tune us in next time, maybe about a week from now. That's all for now. I'm Frank Zimbler for American Atheists.